I will be, so along those lines, so, okay, I'm going to be gone. I'm, yeah, let's say Wednesday. I'm going to be gone Wednesday afternoon, and so there's a possibility. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But just count on Wednesday, TA for now. Um, let's run through some quick practice <coughs> problems. And this should, we'll get all this done today, so tomorrow I'll give you a chance to, to work on this stuff, get questions answered. Okay. I want to look at this graph and I want to answer two questions. I want to answer the one that's that the question actually asks, and then another one that it could have asked. I didn't want to I didn't want to put a bunch of different slides up here. So let's just use this one slide for a couple purposes. A different question that we could have asked, and this this goes back to the first assignment from unit three. This is just unit three, practice one. Okay, we might have said something like this. We might have said, evaluate. f of x when x equals, oh, how about 8? Okay, what's that mean? Let's decode that language first of all. Right, in math, when we're, you know, when we use these words, when we see the word evaluate for a problem, you're pretty happy. Those are the easiest kind to do. What do they mean? Magic deck of cards here. I'm just going to randomly kind of draw people here. What do you say? Okay, so Jaden, help me out. What's that mean? It's eight in for x. Yeah, and that all good. If we put eight in for x and simplify, right? So value means number. Evaluate means enumerate this thing, right? We're just going to plug a number in and see what we get. That's all we do. So we're literally just plugging the 8 into the function. And the way we would write that, we would write that as f of 8 equals and an answer, right? So if I were to do this in unit 2, we would have plugged the 8 in for x every place up here and then combined all those into a number, right? Simplified that expression. But unit 3, we're, you know, this is kind of a break from the algebra for a short period of time here, right? So unit three, we're, we're going to use a graph this time. Based on the graph, how do we interpret this question in terms of the graph? If I'm inputting an x value of 8, what does that mean, Emma? What's that mean? What am I going to do on the graph? I'm asking what question here, essentially. When x equals 8, what is anything? So I, if I let me let me say that again, if I want to evaluate this function at x equals eight, right? X equals eight. Can you? I mean, without answering the whole question, can you tell me something maybe important about that graph, or point me to an important location on that graph that might be interesting? Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. So we'll, here, some somebody. I'm going to give them a pass on this. We'll get back to her. Ashley, help us out. What might be an interesting point to use on this graph, or how could I get to an interesting point? Find what y is perfect. That's really all this is asking. It's saying when x is 8, what is y, right? f of x is just a fancy name for y. And so f of 8 is just really asking the question, well, what's y when we input an 8, right? Well, x equals, x equals 8. There's x equals 8. That's the x-axis, right? So we want to know where does x equal 8 on our graph. We want to know the point with an x-coordinate of 8. So the way we can think about this graphically, we're doing this kind of problem mathematically, is we could just drop down a line that cuts through the x-axis at 8. So here's that line. The name of that line is literally x equals 8. That's how we would write the equation of that line, isn't it? Right? And we want to know where does that line intersect with our function. Well, at that point right there, it looks like, what are the coordinates of that point? 8, negative 9. So what's our answer? 8, 9, negative 9. Negative 9. There it is. Make sense? Okay. Now. 
the question asks actually asks something a little bit different, doesn't it? It says, given that f of x equals this function, solve for f of x equals negative 9. So it's doing kind of the opposite in a way, isn't it? It's saying f of x is a fancy name for y. So it's saying y equals negative 9. What are we trying to find then, probably? X. X, sure. And think, think about how that would have looked last unit, right? Last chapter, we would have just said f of x, which is negative 1 fourth x squared plus 2x minus 9 equal to negative 9 and solve. And think about the stuff we would have done. We probably would have, you know, multiplied or cleared the fractions, multiplied both sides by 4 maybe, right? And then we would have, or maybe we would have added 9 to both sides first, okay? And then we, you know, we would have done a whole, we would have, a lot of thinking would have gone into this process. It would have been very algebraic, right? But we would have come up with some solutions for x because the equation only involves x's, right? We can maybe accomplish that more quickly by just looking at the graph though. Right, so here we've got this graph. What's the line that we're going to intersect with the curve this time, you suppose? Um, Let's see if we are actually you know the next part. Where negative nine is. Okay. So we want to know where, when you say where negative 9 is, you're wanting to know where x or y equals y. negative 9, or y, y equals negative 9. Okay. So the line x equals negative 8, or x equals 8, was a vertical line through 8 on the x-axis. What kind of line is this probably going to be? Horizontal line through negative 9 on the y-axis, right? Well, there's that line right there. And the equation of that line is just y equals negative 9, isn't it? Right? So, well, what do you know? There's one place where it happens. Yeah, so, and there's two intersections, aren't there? So I should expect two solutions. What's the solution I'm getting from this point? 8, because we're looking for the x value, aren't we? So we get an x value of 8. And if we look at this point over here, Yeah, the coordinates there are 0, negative 9. And so taken together, that's giving us, well, here's part of my answer, 0. And, and here's the other part, right? The other part was my 8. Those are my two solutions. Okay. Questions? Right? Coming back a little bit after half a month. So what about this? Okay, this comes from, that looks like a lot of stuff. It's a complicated looking function, lots of decimals in there. Uh, but this comes from the second assignment, which is using technology, right? Using technology to evaluate and solve equations, evaluate functions and solve equations. So all this is really doing is asking us to do that evaluate thing, isn't it? It's giving us a function, uh, p of x. The output is profit. It's, it's predicting profit. The input is x, and x represents the number of years since 2010. So we're inputting a year, and it's outputting a profit. Everybody get that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so what is the value of x that we're going to be inputting? 13. Say it again? 13. 13. Yeah, number of years. So that, does everybody agree 2023 is 13 years after 2010? So really all we're calculating is P of 13, right? Okay. So all we got to do then Yeah, go ahead. So negative point two four x squared plus seven point eight one x minus one point two four. Right there's p of x. We're going to use Desmos on all this stuff. 
all we've got to do is let Desmos tell us that that value, right? Do the work for us. So P of 13 is that, 59.73, right? So let me take a picture of that. And what's our answer then if we follow the directions and round to the nearest 10? Uh, 59.7. Yep. Right? We get that? Okay. So what about this? Let's see. Repeat it. Help us out. Find all real solutions of the equation and round the solutions to the nearest tenth. So, you know, we once again, we could have done this last unit. We could have cleared the fractions, put the equation in standard form, solved the quadratic equation using the best method, hopefully, right? But now we can find a little shortcut. How could we use Desmos to our advantage here? Any ideas? Like, what am I going to graph in Desmos? If I want to know, you know, the solutions, the values of x that are going to make that true. It's been a while. Do you... No? It's not just rise over run. There's a little more to it than that. Do you remember what I could do with that? Well, what my trick is for solving any equation, no matter how hard, if I'm finding real solutions, I can do that graphically. Remember that? Don't remember that? Anybody remember that? That one. Say it, say it again. Okay, okay, good. So so I, there's there's a couple ways you can do this. And you might have found, when you do this, Madeline, do you put the whole thing in? Or do you do, you do it? Do you do it? Okay. So it, we, we can graph. If I want to know, think of it this way. If I want to know when... The function on the left side equals the function on the right side. Wouldn't that be when their graphs cross? Right? Think about the last example we did, or the example before that. If I wanted to know when the function equaled negative 9, I just asked when the graph of the function equaled the graph of negative 9. Right? When y equals, you know, what, negative 1 fourth x squared, blah, 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 e crossed with y equals negative 9. So there's the two graphs, right? So what do you think? What am I going to do here then? Right, and we don't even have to be fancy and use function notation. We could even we can just call it y if we want. We can just set y equal to. I'm just going to graph everything on the left side. So that's just a one eighth x squared plus seven fourths x plus nine halves. And I get some graph, right? That's the graph of everything on the left side. Now let's go down to the next line. And let's do a different graph. Let's graph everything on the right side of the equation. Okay. Oops, I did something. Oh, got the x in the wrong spot. Makes a big difference. How's that? A little better. Right? So look what we've done here. Right? We've got the so we got. Red function is the one on the right, green is the one on the left. So let's just color code that. So this is the red guy. That's the green guy. Right? We want to know when they're equal. Well, when are graphs equal? When they intersect, exactly. So all we've got to do on, on uh, Desmos, then, is just click on the intersection. So if I click right there, there's one intersection and there's the other intersection. Right. So let's take a picture of that. Uh-oh. 
make this picture as small as I can. Oh, darn it. So, Lupita, what are the answers then? Coordinates of the intersections. That's that simple. Okay, so we get negative seven point four. I mean, it tells us to separate our solutions with a comma, so we'll do that. That's fine. And negative four point six. Right? Now, notice this only works for real solutions, okay? That's important. What if these, Jay, yeah, why don't you close that up, please? Uh, what if this, Jay, why don't you close that up, too? Thank you. So what, what if those curves only intersected once? How many real solutions would there be? One. What if they didn't inter intersect at all? Zero. What would that mean if I went back to unit two? and I solved this algebraically, what kind of solutions would I probably have gotten in that case? Imaginary. Imaginary. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Okay, we'll skip that. Same thing. Okay, I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly, too. I want to get through this today so you guys can work tomorrow. So domain and range. Domain is a set of inputs, right? Now, if we follow the direction, it tells us to use set notation, so they've got to be in script brackets. We want to, We always want to, you, when, we, when we're defining sets, we want to write the, the elements in numerical order, smallest to biggest, and we don't repeat elements. So does that make sense? Okay. Does that make sense for the range? Notice I don't write the three twice. Okay. We only, you know, there's only one number three in the output. Okay. Is it a function? Okay, how come? Because no two inputs are the same. Good. No two inputs are the same. Another way of thinking about that is n the, each input only gives you one output, right? So yes, it is. Good. Okay, range of the function. Now, let's do domain first. So let, let's really focus on this one. We can do this one. Everything here on out is dead simple. But we've got to remind ourselves about the notation for this stuff, okay? So let's start with the domain. Okay, so, and I'm coming back at you. Domain, is that X or, X or Y values? X values, good. Okay, so when we're wanting the domain of the function, that's going to be all the X values represented in the graph, right? We talked about that in a couple ways before break. I want to remind you about this because this, this visual part really helps. So we could think about this in terms of all of the X values an ant could step on. And if that works for you, that's that's great. That's a lot of times we'll talk about talk about maybe that way you can count this. Another way that I think is pretty good sometimes too is if we're trying to find the domain, that's the set of all the x values. Well, one way to isolate those is to take this function and just squash it onto the x-axis. If I did that, if I squash this thing onto the x-axis, uh, what's it gonna look like? I and mean, if I take that whole function and I squash it onto the x-axis, what's gonna be left on the x-axis? Uh, negative two and you, now you're looking at just at just a couple key points, but how many points are how many points would it take to string together to make that graph? Well, it takes more than four. So it would be negative five. You go all the way to the It is right. How many points are included in the graph? Well, I mean infinite number of points, right? 
there's, it's on some finite interval here, but there's an infinite number of points. If we zoom in on this, we can't ever see individual points, right? I mean, there's an infinite number of points. But there's an infinite number of them, but they're all going to be represented. Would you agree they're all represented on one line segment if I squash those onto the x-axis? And what's going to be the lower end of that line segment? Ah, okay. So that point right there is going to get squashed down to right there. It's still going to be an open circle, though, because that endpoint is not included, right? This endpoint right here is going to get squashed down to that point right there. And it's a closed endpoint because it is included. And then all the other infinite points are just going to be between those two, right? Everybody agree? So the domain ends up just looking like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? So how do I say that then using inequality notation? Aaron, how would I say that using inequalities? How would I say that domain using inequalities? X is what? Seven. What about seven though? Is it equal to seven? Is it greater than seven? Is it less than seven? Negative five. Okay, that looks pretty good. Any any finishing touches on that? We want to. Ah, okay, good. So on which part? Seven. Okay, there you go. Right. Okay, good. So that's how we'd write that. X is greater than negative five and less than or equal to positive seven. Agree? Okay. What's that look like in terms of interval notation? That's we could use inequality notation, or we could use interval notation. Ah, uh, comma. Good. So we got a comma, and what goes where? Trace. Uh, negative five something else. Right. Yep. And seven with a, a bracket. Okay. Good. And what goes on the left? Uh, or a parenthesis. Good. Good. And how do we remember that the bracket goes on the right? More ink. More ink. More ink to draw the equal sign. More ink to draw the bracket. More ink to fill in the dot. Good. Good. So while we're at it, then what about the range? If I were to squeeze this whole thing instead onto the y-axis, it would just make a line segment in that case too, wouldn't it? What's going to be, Connor, what's going to be the, the top point on that segment, the highest point? Ten. Ten. Good. So that point's going to go to there. Bottom would be? Eight. Good. Right there. And so everything would be in between. Right? Everybody agree? And so for the range? Wouldn't I just get something like y is greater than or equal to negative 6 and less than or equal to positive 10, right? Or something like that, okay? We can skip that, I think. Uh, average rate of change. Okay, remember, average rate of change. Hey, I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on average rate of change, but we probably want to just think of the definition of average rate of change. Average rate of change just means change in the output over change in the input, right? That's all it is, change in the output over change in the input. So it's always going to be, if you want to write that as kind of a formula, it's just going to be the final output minus the initial or starting output. Everybody agree that that equals the change in the output? The final value minus the starting value tells you how much it changed. Okay. Over final n minus initial. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. That works. So another way of saying that, well, if we're on the interval from x equals 6 to x equals 9, x is the input, isn't it? So what's our starting input? What's our starting input? 6. What's our final input? 9. Okay, so we could call, we could say something like x1 equals 6 and x2 equals 9. Right? Uh, what's our starting output? Five. How'd you get that? It's the y value. It's the y value. 
Okay. So we end up with, they were starting at the coordinates 6, 5, and we're ending at the coordinates 9, 7. So would you agree then that y1 equals 5 and y2 equals 7? So another way of saying this is just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? And that just gives us 7 minus 5 over 9 minus 6, so 2 thirds. Could we see that more easily on that graph? Rise over run, isn't it? Look, the rise is plus two, and the run is plus three. Rise over run is two thirds. What do you know? Okay, so moral of the story if you have a graph, the average rate of change, all it is is the slope of the segment connecting the two points. That's it, right? That's it. Real quick, uh, let's look at another one very quick, and let's do, let's use our trick. So x equal, we're going to start at negative 7 for x and end at negative 5. So we're going from that point to that point. Quick, what's the average rate of change? 2. No. I heard it. 0. Yeah, it's a horizontal line. The slope is 0, isn't it? The rise is 0. The run is 2, but 0 divided by 2 is 0. Okay, what about something like that? So I want to be quick with this because I want to get through this. Um, would you agree here that this is a Desmos problem, isn't it? Let's make, see if this makes sense. I just took a picture of what this would be on Desmos. So the same as before, right? We know that average rate of change is just going to be final output minus starting output over final input minus starting input. Well, the function is given to us right here. Would you agree that for this problem, what x value does our starting value correspond to? x1 is 4, isn't it? Because 2014 is 4 years after 2010. What's x2? 8, right. And so instead of using y's this time, why not just use our function notation, right? Wouldn't you agree that this is saying the final output is the value of the function when I plug in an 8, right? So p of 8 minus the starting output value is whatever I get when I plug 4 into my function, the starting input, right? Divided by final input of 8 minus starting input of 4. Okay, well, why do all that? I can let Desmos do that. If I just define the function here, there's my function, right? I just write my function in Desmos. Then if I just write out that expression in Desmos, it tells me the answer, 2.57, right? So if I round to the nearest tenth, 2.6 is the answer. Okay, last one. Uh, use one or more inequalities to write intervals on which the function is decreasing. Okay, where is this function decreasing? Where does the function decrease? What's that mean in terms of the graph? Where is what? It's decreasing. What would the ant be doing as he walks from left to right? Walking downhill, right? So where is it decreasing? Well, let's squash the part where it's decreasing. Let's think about the part where it's decreasing. It starts there. It's already decreasing, as in it? He's walking downhill all the way until he gets down to, when does it stop? There. Right there. When he gets to the bottom, it's no longer decreasing. That's the transition from de decreasing to increasing, right? So if I were to squeeze all that up onto the x-axis, wouldn't it just look like this? So there's the decreasing interval right there, right? Okay? All right.